Welcome to the ISF podcast from the Information Security Forum. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and I'm glad to welcome you back to our program, featuring cutting-edge conversations with business leaders and creative luminaries tailored to global security professionals. Today, ISF CEO Steve Durbin is in conversation with Thomas Earle, a best-selling IT author and the founder of Architura Education, which offers vendor-neutral training and certification programs. Steve and Thomas discuss how to resolve the skills shortage, the purpose of vendor-neutral training, the coming disruption of digital transformation, and more. Thomas, thanks very much indeed for joining us on this podcast today. A whole range of different things that we've got to talk about, particularly around people, around education, training in the security space, and probably a little bit outside that. But before we start, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and your work. Well, it all started about 15 years ago. I began writing books for Prentice Hall at the time. I wrote books dedicated to XML, service technology, service-oriented architecture, and the books were relatively successful given you know the type of book volumes they look at in the IT book market. So Prentice Hall offered me a book series, mm-hmm. which then evolved into 13 titles that I authored and co-authored with other subject matter experts on a range of topics that included cloud computing, big data, various aspects of service technology. And so... That established a relatively large library of content that naturally evolved into educational curriculum. And then that further evolved into formal accreditation. And the basis, the premise of a lot of this was the fact that it's purely vendor neutral. Everything that we documented, everything that the courses and the accreditations were based on, were focused on the fact that it's a representation of where a certain technology innovation or field of practice was within the industry after having reached an acceptable level of maturity and just documenting it as it is with its benefits, with its flaws, providing concrete mapping across different patterns and models and mechanisms and tools, but providing it in a purely vendor neutral manner so that organizations could bring that knowledge base into their environments across their project teams And there would be no ambiguity regarding perception or opinion of certain technologies. There would just be the concrete facts as to how contemporary fields of practice exist now within the industry and how do they compare and to what extent are they compatible with an organization's business goals. So you you take that knowledge, you marry it with an organization's goals and parameters and limitations and then see to what extent it makes sense to adopt it, and then also extract from that criteria that you can use to apply to when you actually select certain vendor technologies and choose best of breed selections based on your understanding of the platforms and environments from that industry level perspective. So instead of learning about a new area of technology, a new innovation or a new field of practice through adopting a vendor's product line, you learn about it from that vendor neutral perspective and then apply that perception to choosing the best vendor and understanding how you can best evolve your organizational IT enterprise, IT ecosystem without inadvertently forming harmful, potentially harmful or limiting dependencies on certain vendor environments. And just having that loose coupling between how you want to evolve your models, your environments, and the vendor technologies available to you. So that's the premise of all the work we've done, and that's something we continue now into the digital transformation age. So what sort of professionals enroll in your course? Is it mostly IT people, or or do you find that other people outside of that are also getting involved? Traditionally, it's been IT people. It's been organizations wanting their project teams educated and bringing them all on the same page in terms of their understanding of a new field of practice or a new innovation that may have not yet entered or that may be unfamiliar to the organization as a whole, and making sure that everyone has a common understanding so that they establish a communications framework so they can discuss and plan for a potential adoption or for a decision-making process in associated with a potential adoption. They can do so clearly without any misperceptions and ambiguity and that then carries forward into how projects are documented when there's clarity around how certain technology advances are 
communicated and then documented and then those projects are carried out that minimizes a great deal of risk that can come with different perceptions or different opinions or different proprietary characteristics and tendencies that vendors themselves have with their product lines to distinguish themselves. So it has traditionally been IT professionals, organizational teams for which private training events are delivered, but also many individual IT professional freelancers that want to improve their marketability within the industry to show that they have demonstrated proficiency in new areas of technology, which is what we focus on. We're always on top of the new technology trends that have reached an acceptable level of maturity, and that's when we capture them and provide this vendor-neutral training and accreditation. Having said that, last year we did launch a junior IT professional academy targeted at the age 16 to age 20 demographic mm -hmm. because we found increasing demand from schools, private schools, post-secondary institutions to begin teaching some of these contemporary areas of technology to the students at a younger age. They're becoming part of our mainstream educational community. So instead of someone having to catch up with it after they graduate from university, there's now a need for or educational institutions to bring that into, but not just post-secondary, to actually bring it to the, the secondary educational level and teach 16-year-olds about artificial intelligence and, and data science and cloud computing because it will relate to the world that they will enter in just a few years because it has become so integrated and so commonplace in, in how we function, not just within IT, but with many organizations outside of IT that rely on technology to carry out their their industries, their professions. Yeah, absolutely. And the way in which you conduct this training, is it in person? Is it online? I, I guess a lot of it's had to move online, even if it wasn't. Um. <laughs> yeah, everything's online now. Um, we have a network of training partners around the world that deliver training to their respective regions and in different languages as well. The training also can be delivered directly through us when there are gaps in geographical coverage. So the training is available at architura.com slash workshops. There's our calendar. There are dozens and dozens of workshops in different time zones and different types of scheduling formats. Usually a given workshop is centered around a certification track. But um, yes, the training is available via instructor-led virtual classrooms, but all courses are also available via e-learning kits and self-study kits that can be purchased on the online store that allows anybody access to the materials to work through them and then prepare for the exams at their own pace. And all the exams, we have over 80 exams published with Pearson View that are available via Pearson View Online Proctoring and also eventually once COVID is under control somewhat, they can also then revisit the uh, Pearson View testing centers. So we've had all our exams. We've now had a growing portfolio and our programs have, for most of their lifespan, been available via testing centers and online proctoring around the world. Right. And obviously, you mentioned this, you know, that this need to really understand how the different technologies are being developed is going to be fundamental for anybody who is going through the school system today. It doesn't really matter which country we're talking about, because that is going to be the way that business is transacted using those sorts of tools. Do you have any concerns about that? Do you think we're moving perhaps towards too much focus on technology in the workplace or what's your take on that? It's a really good question. You could ask 10 people in different professions that question and get 10 completely different answers because it really relates to how technology impacts the scope of what they do within a given industry. And so I think there is more than ever a heightened potential to adopt too much technology to incorporate too much automation and to form too great of a reliance on technology than ever before, just because of the levels of sophistication that technologies have risen to. And these are technologies that are not brand new. These are technologies that have been undergoing their own evolutionary cycles for a long time, but have now become commodities, have entered the IT mainstream and are training, accreditation, tools, and accessibility, economical accessibility to these technologies is now more favorable than ever before as well. So there's a constant struggle because organizations do need to balance and moderate their adoption. At the same time, what we've seen is so many organizations are concerned that if they move too slowly with regards to adoption, they'll be left behind by competitors that are adopting more aggressively 
and are leveraging these technologies to obtain a greater market share and business edge in, in their respective marketplaces. So there's always this tendency, this temptation to say, okay, well, let's just, you know, go with this greater extent of automation without perhaps understanding what the cultural consequences may be within the organization, but also what other consequences there may be, especially in relation to security. It's easy to focus on optimizing business processes disrupting new markets, introducing your products and services in new markets by leveraging all these digital transformation innovations. But it's difficult to anticipate how that may expose your data, your processes, your services to new security threats, or perhaps inadvertently expose other data that you may have collected on behalf of customers or partners or other entities that may now be inadvertently exposed through your actions having carried forward, you know, perhaps too much automation and then have to react to that or pay some sort of uh, consequence as a result of it. So that's what needs to be understood more than ever is if we move to this level of automation, if we digitize all of this data that we've previously had full control of internally and expose it in not just to a limited number of uh, users or, or individuals, but now expose it to global access via the web, what are the potential risks that we are assuming by doing that? And so it's the greater the insight of those potential consequences when putting together that type of project plan, the more measured the project plan can be carried out. So that balance is more important than ever because of the fact that we're moving services, products and data to a potentially global accessibility. And so at the same time, other organizations are doing it right. We, we see others doing it, not having a problem and making business advances by doing so. So it's that balance that needs to be defined and carried out in a measured manner. And the only way to do that is to have the greatest proficiency of input in terms of your resources, your consultants, your security professionals, and the decision-making that is carried out to uh, move from milestone to milestone in that measured manner while still hopefully supporting your business goals. So the short answer is it really comes down to the in-house intelligence you have that will feed into that process. If you have highly qualified individuals that understand not just current security measures, current cybersecurity practices, preemptive practices, but also understand where all this is going in the next year or two, and can then consult and advise on how a given project can be rolled out to ensure an acceptable level of risk, an acceptable level of security controls, while still meeting business goals, while still getting the necessary budget and support, then it can move ahead. And I think that that is something that organizations sometimes overlook now because they are too concerned about keeping up with their competitors just in terms of automation adoption in general. I think you make some really good points there about balance. And you know, we've just released our Threat Horizon report for 2023, which tries to look two years out to try to provide business leaders primarily with input into the sorts of areas they need to be working with their security and IT colleagues on to really ensure that what's going on from the technical perspective is also matching the business goals. And some of the things that we're increasingly concerned about in that report are things like overconfidence in security this reduction in human involvement and over-reliance on systems, particularly on systems that perhaps, you know, practitioners don't fully understand. So they haven't gone through the process that you've just been laying out there. Perhaps they haven't had the opportunity to go on the right number of training courses and so on, because obviously in the security space, as we know, there is a skill shortage. We're talking about challenges that uh, security professionals face from things like burnout and overwork. And so it, this balancing act that we need to go back through of you know, how much time are we going to set aside, I guess, for people to really understand some of the solutions they're putting in, particularly when we get into areas such as artificial intelligence, automated defense, or just the different layers of security that we're starting to see there. You know, and there are some areas that people listening to this may find just sort of mind boggling. You know, if you look at an average security organization, they're using in a large organization, they're using something like 130 different security tools. Well, to your point about really understanding 
what goes into all of those, the amount of time that's required to do that is, uh, is it being taken into account. I mean, in your experience, you know, you've got a, a whole range of people coming through on these different sorts of training courses. Are employers willing now to set aside the time for people to really understand some of these emerging technologies? Or is it individuals in their own time trying to keep up and abreast because it's good for career progression, development, and so on? Right. I, it's a great question. It's a very broad question. I think that there is an increasing awareness of this, but I don't think, in my opinion anyways, in terms of the IT community at large as a whole, I don't think there's a sufficient awareness of this. And again, not to knock on the vendors, because the vendors drive innovation, what all the technology vendors do for the industry is make all of the sophisticated technology available to us, and, and that's what defines what is out there. But vendors are also focused on product sales. And so when you adopt a product line and learn through that, it's difficult sometimes to fully understand what the impact will be on your organization in terms of, you know, those types of issues, both in terms of security, but also just cultural and organizational issues that will impact the foundation, the structure and dynamics within your organization. Digital transformation is extremely disruptive in that manner or can be to the extent that it can be adopted because of course it takes digital media and digital automation outside of organizational boundaries and with IoT and other advances that now can affect physical interaction, physical dynamics, logistics, and and transport, all relating to core systems and data collection streams that, again, it's disruptive, but in a very attractive way to many organizations. But what is essential is that organizations understand the bare facts and have a clear understanding that the adoption of this can lead to this. It comes with these risks. It has these deficiencies currently in the industry. And those need to be balanced against the goals and benefits and the positive potential that that adoption can bring about. So having an industry level vendor neutral understanding of that is critical to making the correct decisions in terms of what to adopt, to what extent and at what rate the adoption should be carried out. So that's more important now than ever with digital transformation and similar types of adoption initiatives. The other aspect to all this, which I feel is very much overlooked, which I think is also critical, is governance. Mm -hmm. Organizations need to establish a governance framework, not once the solution is already built and operational, but a governance framework needs to be established before the project is even planned so that the governance oversees the planning and the execution of that plan. And governance frameworks, they establish precepts, processes, and roles that are then applied. They're customized based on the nature of the project and the nature of the organization. And then the project is carried out in a regulated manner so that there is control from beginning to end. And that's more important than ever when security is such a core part of carrying out the project, implementing what is delivered by the project, and then maintaining and evolving the solution that you've built. Security needs to evolve with the solution over time. And security needs to be factored in, in terms of the roles, presets, and processes that are applied, along with other parts of the governance framework that oversee the quality and efficiency and reliability and other operational characteristics. A governance framework can significantly reduce the risk of not just security, but also just failed projects that don't perform as expected. And the governance framework is the best way to ensure that the security controls that are required are in place and that they evolve along with the solution as the landscape of security and risk within the IT industry continues to evolve and become more sophisticated as well. So that is not new. We've had IT governance for many years, but it's usually been applied in a more narrow scope to specific types of projects, cloud governance or service governance or big data governance or, you know, a sector or a division within an IT enterprise will have its own governance framework. We apply to that and then it is carried out within that limited scope. But now with us putting everything online and exposing a lot of data and access, having a governance framework that encompasses all of that, along with how all that integrates with our existing legacy environment 
is extremely important. It's an investment that organizations need to look at making initially. It's a level of discipline that organizations need to apply to carry out the regulatory requirements of the framework to make sure that we stick to those precepts and processes to ensure that certain requirements are met as we progress with the adoption and then the operation of the solution. So that comes down to a level of organizational maturity that Mm -hmm. needs to be assessed for organizations willing to do so, so that they can understand, are we actually sufficiently mature to carry this out successfully? And even those that say, yes, we can do a governance framework, we can apply it, we can build it, we can carry out our projects accordingly, a maturity assessment helps organizations understand whether culturally and whether skill set wise, they have the ability to enforce certain regulatory requirements of the framework so that things are carried out in a consistent and disciplined manner because organizations are sometimes very hesitant to get into the policing of IT solutions. It sometimes runs contrary to IT culture where creativity and freedom are are often advocated to, you know, generate new ideas and to have an environment that is attractive for people to work at. So it's another level of balance that needs to be achieved. But that is, if organizations can achieve that, that can address a number of the concerns you raised because it pinpoints those specific risks. And that also relates to positioning human involvement among automation processes. If we understand ahead of time what the potential risks are and we understand what rules or regulations need to follow to minimize those risks, to preemptively build controls in response to those risks, we also understand where strategically to position human involvement with regards to how security policies and controls and reactions are carried out, and in terms of reviews and enhancements over time, and then maintain the discipline to maintain that human involvement, not to fall into the temptation of over-automating security responses or security-related decision-making that we may want to defer to AI systems, but to truly ensure that there is the correct balance of leveraging the technology that is out there but having the human element constantly involved to ensure that we never over-rely upon it and then regret doing so. Indeed, you're absolutely right. I couldn't agree more, particularly with so many of these different solutions that are being both talked about by the vendors, as you say, who obviously have an interest in driving things forward, but also in organizations who I think are really trying to come up with solutions to challenges they haven't had to face before. The pandemic being just one that threw up a whole range of different things. Compliance, of course, has been around for a little bit longer. But having that overall governance structure that allows for you to actually plan for the different interventions at each and every stage, I think is certainly a potential solution in there. I wanted to talk a little bit to you as well about digital transformation, because for me, that's the next stage on, right? We've got a whole range of organizations that are going through change at the moment. But for many, the goal is this thing that they call digital transformation. And, you know, to your point earlier, you could ask 10 different people and you'd get 10 different answers, right? But what does digital transformation mean for you? Because I know that you're in the process of releasing a digital transformation curriculum around digital transformation security. So tell us a little bit about that. Certainly. Digital transformation has evolved into an approach to leverage technology innovation that has evolved to a point that it has become part of the IT mainstream in relation to how the global marketplace itself has evolved. So organizations now have the opportunity to adopt very powerful technologies, and that will provide many new opportunities for automation that did not exist before. To the extent that the technologies can themselves be given the responsibility of making decisions that humans previously did, and therefore be more responsive and perhaps make decisions more intelligently and make discoveries in relation to one's marketplace that we may have never even thought about previously. So by leveraging technologies associated with contemporary data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, by leveraging technologies associated with internet of things and device-based networks and telemetry data that can now and is now being collected from billions of devices around the world and is further progressing rapidly with new, more powerful networks. And by leveraging enhanced abilities to lock down, secure, and control data through blockchain distributed ledgers, 
which are no longer limited to cyber currencies. Blockchain architecture itself now has become a legitimate form of technology architecture that can be adopted by organizations not involved in finance, but to lock down and distribute the control and the authority over certain types of valuable data in a very, very secure manner. All these things can interrelate to form very powerful new automation environments that have not only the ability to improve what we've been doing before, but significantly broaden the scope to which the audience and marketplace and the scope of business that we may have never been able before to reach. So it's disruptive in a manner that we can now provide services, provide products online to marketplaces well beyond our traditional marketplaces by leveraging these environments and also by allowing automation resulting from these technology innovations to now carry out and overtake many of the roles that were previously performed by humans and by doing so in a balanced and ethical manner so that human assets can be reallocated, retrained for new types of roles to better support other parts of the company and so that automation, new powerful automation and potential automated decision-making can now take on a number of those roles in a manner that improves the efficiency, the reliability, and the overall scope of our business. We can now do things better, faster, easier, improve customer experiences, and reach customers well beyond our traditional marketplaces. So digital transformation is a very broad field that encompasses all of that. There is as much of a business impact and business considerations to it, cultural, organizational, as there is technological. And it's so broad that it really needs to be truly understood to identify how it best relates to your organization. Most organizations will only require a subset of what digital transformation has to offer. So in our courses, for example, we identify the common models of digital transformation that exist so that you can associate what model is most relevant to the nature of your organization, to the nature of your business, and then further augment that to work with what your goals are. But because of the broad scope of digital transformation from both business and technological sides, there's a a learning curve there that is more significant than any other learning curve from any other previous IT innovation, because it is more than just technology. It's technology that can be leveraged to transform an organization at its very core, We may have an organization that has been operating a certain way, even with many technology advances over the past few decades, where when they identify how digital transformation innovations can benefit them in their marketplace, the adoption of that could result in a complete transformation of the organization itself, in addition to how it affects their IT landscape, meaning that they may have new roles that they need to fulfill, such as highly proficient cybersecurity experts who need to navigate this adoption, but many roles that also may need to be reallocated due to the increased potential for automation. So it's something that can't be ignored because many organizations have already identified the business potential of this for their own business areas and own business domains and are actively moving ahead with this right now. So it's one of those Uh, innovations that impacts us significantly. It's comparable to how the internet impacted us a couple of decades ago, how cloud computing impacted us about a decade ago. And now this is the next big milestone that leverages all of that in addition to further technology innovations, many of which were also in development for decades. All of this is converging now to produce a very powerful set of practices and technologies that can truly take organizations to greater levels. But of course, that has to be carried out properly for that success to be achieved. Where there is much potential, there is also much risk of misappropriating or misusing those innovations in the wrong way. I don't mean necessarily maliciously, but also just not doing it in a competent manner so that you actually take steps backwards, spend a lot of time and money building something that doesn't realize your goals, whereas other organizations are taking step forward. So governance, again, is a core part of ensuring a solid plan moving ahead. 
Yes, I was just going to say, it sounds to me as if it brings it all together, the things we've just been talking about. You know, it's about the clarity of what you're trying to do. It's about the investment in the people as well who are going to have to implement some of these things, the understanding of the technologies and how they can really help you. And then to your point, governance, certainly to overlay that and make sure that it all is working and indeed is managed in a risk appropriate fashion, whatever that looks like across your enterprise. Thomas, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much indeed for spending the time and really sort of walking us through the different stages, if you like, of the way in which technology training has evolved, the needs to carry on, really providing that across a wide range of not just organizations, but also, as you pointed out, into our school systems. And of course, coming back to that, that real emphasis around the overriding governance and the importance of risk management in all of this. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you indeed. Thank you, Steve. Hope to talk to you again soon. A lot to consider there about skill building in our workforce, as well as assessing risk and keeping the big picture in mind. Next week, we'll be back with Steve in conversation with Dr. Margaret Cunningham, Principal Research Scientist at Forcepoint. Dr. Cunningham will talk about leading a team that's working from home, hiring and onboarding in post-COVID times, and building your team's communication skills. I think that to help people avoid burnout, we have to allow people to build expertise that is a little bit more focused and to let people stay on their tasks for a little bit longer. Whether that means you need more people, whether that means you need to figure out what the workflow is, it's up to you and how you run your company. But by asking people to you know, answer phone calls, deal with escalations, watch the security, manage people on top of that, We're definitely asking too much. We look forward to bringing you the full conversation. In the meantime, we invite you to tune into our catalog of video and podcast episodes, all of which you can find at securityforum.org. We invite you to follow the audio feed wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd be grateful if you'd recommend us so that we can reach new audiences and continue to bring you these timely discussions. You can always join in the conversation on our LinkedIn page or get in touch directly through our website, where you can also download ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like these. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert. Music by Alexander Filipiak. Associate producer, Katie Flood. Mix and master by Brian Barney. Thanks for listening.